Here on, uh, along with me at the table, we, I have Dr. Uh, Alok Sen as the convener, uh, Dr. Chaitra, she is not with here, Dr. Avninder Gupta as the co-chairman, Dr. Rajpal as the chairman, uh, me, Dr. Manavi and Dr. Pooja are the moderators for this session. Uh, we shall proceed and start off the session with the first talk being the AP State Ophthalmological Society uh, Innovative DIY Manual Technique for sil Silicon Oil Removal by Dr. Ashok. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, good afternoon all. I will be talking about an innovative uh, do-it-yourself manual technique for uh, silicone oil removal versus a machine-based approach. It is a comparative study. I don't have any financial interest. So the aim is to study the efficacy of manual silicone oil removal by modified innovative technique as compared to the vitrectomy machine based approach. Uh, this was a comparative uh, interventional case series with a total of 20 eyes. Group A had 10 patients undergoing SOR by modified manual technique and group B had patients by vitrectomy machine based approach. Uh, the study was conducted from Jan to March 2023. All the patients posted for silicone oil removal without the need for any adjuvant uh, procedures were included in this case series. Uh, coming to the vitrectomy machine based approach, this is how with the uh, machine based approach we can see the silicon oil come into the extrusion syringe of the uh, tube, tubing and you can see uh, the extrusion is very slow, the silicon oil comes very slow, slowly into the syringe and this is all the equipment which is required for the vitrectomy machine based approach. Whereas in our modified manual technique what you require is just a short cut end of a infusion tubing wherein you cut it like this, it's around 5 to 6 mm and you connect it to the syringe and once it is done that this is what you require and uh, you, the video is showing the ports and the infusion bottle which is connected to the eye with the help of an infusion bottle and it is connected via three way and you can see manually you just put the infusion sleep onto the trocar of the 23 gauge stroker and just manually pull it and you can see clearly that it comes very fastly with this and the residual bubbles are removed with uh, and uh, fundus is examined and partial fluid air exchange is done. So the time taken for SOR by both the techniques was noted along with any adverse events. The patients were examined on post-op day one, one week and one month. On follow-ups their BCVA, IOP and status of retina was observed. Any other complications in either of the procedures were noted. So these are the results of our manual technique and this our vitrectomy based approach. The average study of the patients were, uh, age of the patients of the study was 49 plus or minus 3.9 years, 9 were females and 11 were males. So the preoperative pre BCVA range from hand movements to 618, all the cases had 1500 centistox uh, density silicone oil. The mean time taken uh, for SOR by our technique was around 1.9 two minutes uh, whereas the machine based approach it took around 5.2 minutes the post operative visual acuity range from 1 by 60 to 618 there was no intraoperative or post operative complications with either of those so coming to the discussion earlier in a 20 gauge era the the garodia et al uh, described an active suction using uh, 19 gauge cannulas but whereas in 2007 Capron et al advocated a technique of active removal with the help of a 25 gauge micro cannulas which were specifically designed for this. Uh, but there are other studies by Zhang et al and Zhongling et al where Zhang et al has described a vitrectomy independent uh, machine independent technique of 5000 centistoke silicon oil removal with the help of a 10 ml syringe which is lifted manually and fixed with the help of a clamp by an assistant. Zonglin et al did a comparative series wherein he compared the vitrectomy and a manual based approach wherein he used a 10 ml syringe. He described that vitrectomy approach was advantageous uh, because of the controlled negative pressure uh, rather than a manual technique which was faster and effective but it required caution because there was an uncontrolled pressure with the help of a manual technique. So what uh, we came to know is the 10 ml syringe when lifted up it uh, to the mark of 4.5 it generates a 676 mm of HG when the plunger is fixed with the help of a clamp. So this can result in an adverse collapse of an eyeball during SOR. So our modified technique used a 5cc syringe 
which is safer and takes away the need for an assistant to clamp the plunger in as well. So when we talk of uh, carbon neutrality nowadays, the hardly what we are using is just a cut end of a small infusion thing and a 5cc syringe. So there is much to reduce and uh, nothing to reuse actually. So to conclude, our technique involves a minimal equipment. So this technique may be used to perform SOR in an ophthalmic institute where it is devoid of a vitrectomy machine setup also. So our technique is economical, safe, time efficient and an environmentally friendly approach to SOR. Thank you. Yeah, one question. Yes, sir. Uh, you know ki after SOR or during the procedure, you can land up into a retinal detachment. Yes, sir. The rate is somewhere around 10%. Yes, sir. So, uh, are you comfortable doing silicon oil removal in the absence of a machine? Sir, uh, that's what, sir, in, in my inclusion criteria, that's what I mentioned. Majority of it, what we have uh, chosen is a well-attached retina, wherein we didn't even have another thing of even adding any step to the procedure, sir. In the no. way that I, I totally agree your point that interoperatively at least uh, we've selected cases where we didn't want to have any thorough examination was done all the brakes were attached and there was no advent procedure sir even in the form of a membrane being there which required peeling even after a very meticulous examination you can land up into uh, detachments post-operatively so uh, my take is if you are into a system where you don't have a vitreous surgery, vitreous machine and doing a silicon oil removal, even if you have an hypotony, you will have a bleed. So how will you manage that? So there are different situations during surgery, you cannot be 100% sure. Yes. Uh, Chalo. Thank you. Next presenter. Uh, thank you very much for that interesting presentation. The next we'll have the BR of the Medical Society. Uh, paper, clinical angiographic comparison of retinal findings and a new classification system for hypertensive retinopathy. Next, 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 so, next, next. Okay, uh, we'll in Indian population. I have no financial disclosure. A brief overview about intravitreal brolizumab. As we know, it is known by as uh, Paginax. It was mainly approved by the FDA for... One second. Slide, slide. Uh, mainly approved by the FDA for uh, neovascular age-related macular degeneration in 2019 and diabetic macular edema by 2022. The main important uh, catchy thing about Brulizumab is that it lacks the, the uh, fragment constant region. It is mainly composed of only the single chain variable fragments, about 252 amino acids. It is mainly generated from the naive human spleen DNA. Uh, the complement determining regions were grafted to soluble human uh, human. Uh, fragment uh, variable regions from the binding site. The uh, mechanism of action as we can see uh, blocks mainly the wedge of R1 and R2 receptors and thereby leading to decreased growth of uh, neovascular lesions and uh, thereby resolving the retinal edema. The main thing is that the molecular weight of brolizumab is about 26 kilo daltons which is many many times smaller when compared to that of the other anti of regions thereby leading to higher molar moses and thereby leading to higher drug concentration ultimately reaching uh, better depths of penetrations. So uh, our aim of our study is to determine the functional and anatomical outcomes and to also to see the safety profile of brolizumab in patients especially with recalcitrant macular edema who have at least received three doses of avastin. Uh, ours was a retrospective study which was conducted between July 2021 and December 2022. The following parameters such as the demographic parameters, indication, central foveal thickness, uh, baseline intraocular pressure and IOP at each follow-up were uh, also followed up. And we also uh, looked for the OCT biomarkers for predicting the outcomes of our study. Uh, patients with recalcitrant macular edema with at least uh, uh, recalcitrant to at least three injections of avastin uh, of the following indications were included such as age related macular degeneration, diabetic macular edema and retinal vein occlusion. Patients were at least followed for three months. Patients with poor vision and less than three doses of intravitreal avastin and uh, pre-existing glaucoma and patients with less than uh, uh, three months of follow-up and with uh, those who underwent any intraocular surgery within less than three months were excluded from our study. So this is the flowchart. The patients who had a, a recalcitrant macular edema 
with more than three doses of Avastin were included and they were in injected with intravital brulezizumab and they were followed up for three months initially and then followed six months. So about nine, nine cases were of belonging to the age-related macular degeneration and uh, 13 patients were of diabetic macular edema and three patients had retinal vein occlusion in our study. The visual outcome was also, also good, uh, it also showed an improvement at the end of the three months. The central foveal thickness also showed a good reduction from the baseline. This is the OCT picture showing the resolution of the macular edema. The IOP response was also favorable. So uh, we looked for the markers such as intraretinal fluid, subretinal fluid and subfoveal hyperreflective material in the study to predict the visual outcome and the anatomical uh, outcomes. About 23 cases had a subretinal fluid and the uh, intraretinal fluid and subretinal uh, subfoveal hyperreflective material was found in uh, each cases. All of the uh, cases, about uh, uh, 24 cases showed a resolution of the fluid. <clears throat> this is a comparison between the Avastin. As we can see that the Avastin has about, uh, about three injections compared to that of the Brazilian have only one injection. And uh, there was a significant uh, reduction, about one third uh, number of injections were reduced from uh, comparing to the Avastin to that of Brolosizumab. We had adneroruvitis and congestion in about two and one cases respectively. So this is a short term follow up and we have a smaller sample size. So 23 eyes of 25 hours showed a uh, complete response, uh, that is the complete drying of the uh, edema or the fluid and 17 patients uh, had a complete resolution. The central foveal thickness showed a 60.83% reduction from the baseline. The number of average number of injections of brulezizumab was found to be about 1.4 and the average interval between the two injections of brulezizumab is found to be 4.5 which is higher than any other, uh, any other anti-VEGF. So brulezizumab is safe and effective in patients with recalcitrant edema uh, who are uh, recalcitrant to other cases. These are my references and thank you. Uh, so, you had two cases of anterior uveitis in your, and your total sample size was how many patients? 25 more. So, that is quite significant and, and you have given hardly one injection, right? Yes. How many injections per patient? Uh, only one. So, these two with anterior uveitis, did they receive repeat injections? No. Or was this with just one injection? Only one. So, that is a significant safety issue. No, that in just 25 patients, you have two patients who have had a reaction because your title says safety and efficacy. Yeah? Yes, ma'am. And uh, how many of your Avastin patients, did they have any reaction? No. Over so many you had given? None of them. So, I think if you want to compare, you have to have that data of comparing okay. Bevacizumab with Brolocizumab. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, Thank you. Now we can have a next. I just have a comment. Why did you say in the title that it is in uh, you are looking at safety and efficacy in Indian population mm, Indian when population. the sample is just so small? Yes, so sir. Small. That is our limitation. We have uh, so you small you must be very careful when you write such okay. a title. Indian population. Indian Thank population. You. Okay. Next. Uh, next, can we have Dr. Vishnu? Clinical features, diagnostic challenges, and multimodal imaging in pre papillary vascular loops. Vishnu is the second one. Second? Achha. Thik hai, thik hai. His presentation. Uh, Good morning. Vishnu. Good afternoon. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank the AOS team and my teachers from Aravind Eye Care Hospital for giving me this opportunity. So, I'll be talking on... Just a minute, sorry. This is not the presentation. Dusri hai, second. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, I'll be talking on clinical features, diagnostic challenges, and multimodal imaging in pre-papillary vascular loops. Case number one, we had a 50-year-old male referred from general OPD for query neovascularization of the disc. He had no systemic comorbidities. His best corrected visual acuity was 6, 6, and 6 in both the eyes. Anterior segment examination was unremarkable other than the presence of early cataract. So right eye fundus examination was normal. Uh, left eye showed, I'll just zoom in the fundus picture. Left eye showed a single division of the artery with multiple loops superior to the disc. There were no signs of NVE in the periphery. There were no breaks or tears. This is the OCT of the same patient 
showing uh, the position of the loops which is located in the innermost area near the RNFL and vitreoretinal interface. FFI was done for this patient and it was quite unremarkable. There were no late phases of leakage or staining seen. So case number two, we had a 22-year-old male referred from general OPD for floaters for the past three to four months. He had no systemic comorbidities. His best corrected visual acuity was 6, 6 and 6 in both the eyes. Anterior segment was unremarkable in both the eyes. Fundus of the examination of the right eye was normal. I'll be zooming the fundus picture of the left eye where we see the inferior division of the artery showing multiple loops with no shunting across the nearby vessels. FFA, uh, before going to the FFA, this is the OCT of the same patient showing the presence of vitreous hemorrhage and the more inner uh, location of the loops with uh, uh, near the vitreoretinal interface. FFA done showed uh, no again no significant leakage but there was mild staining in the late phase. Case 3, we had a 47 year old female who was diabetic for the past 15 years. Best corrected visual acuity in right eye was 624 and left eye was 6998. Anterior segment e uh, examination was unremarkable. Uh, right eye fundus was post vitrectomized eye for traction retinal de detachment for, uh, di due to diabetic retinopathy and left eye was uh, status post PRP. Here we can see a uh, loop, uh, arterial loop, single vessel arterial loop with no shunting seen projecting into the vitreous. This is again the video of the same patient showing a pulsatile arterial loop. Okay, next we go into the OCT. OCT done over the loop showed a central lumen with projection into the vitreous. So our clinical diagnosis, pre-papillary vascular loops. Our DDs were optociliary collateral veins and retinal arterial veil anastomosis and cilia optic vein and acquired loop following CRA occlusion. Uh, congenital retinal vascular anomalies include the following, anomalous macro, macro vessel, arterial arterial crossings, venous, venous crossings, triple branching, congenital tortuosity and PVLs. PVLs were described as a congenital vascular anomaly. It uh, initially misdiagnosed as a variant of hyaloid vessels, but recent histopath and FFA shows uh, they are either a branch from retinal artery or vein ending at the disc. They can also project some distance into the vitreous. Coming into the pathogenesis, we all know that retina is supplied by hyaluronic artery up to the fourth gestation month. At fourth month, primitive vascular mesenchymal camel cells near hyaluronic artery invade the RNFL forming retinal arterial system. During the, this formation, when the primitive mesenchymal camel cells deviate from their normal path, we get the PVLs. Mansur et al. in their uh, multicentric collaborative retrospective study uh, classified uh, PVLs into six types. The first one is uh, a flat intraretinal loop with no associated retinal vascular anomalies. The second one is flat intraretinal loop over the disc with retinal arterial or vein anomalies as seen in our case one and two. The third one is a figure of eight, I mean a small uh, Chinese letter pattern loop which is most commonly seen in Asians. The fourth one is a figure of eight uh, loop. The fifth one is a uh, core screw type and the sixth one is any loop with vitreopapillary traction. This is the proposed classification by Mansur et al. Torture city patients, they can have either torturous hairpin or loop or spiral. Uh, Somi et al. Pro published a case where they had a B scan with, uh, uh, where they had a VH with brown cataract, B scan showed again VH. While doing uh, PPV uh, with FACO, which is uh, massive bleed from the stump of disc was noted and after one week which is lavage was done uh, fundus showed a uh, vascular loop projecting into the vitreous cavity which was confirmed by the OCT. A retrospective analysis by Shinji showed uh, a prevalence of PVLs to be 0.115 percent. Complications they are mostly asymptomatic but they can cause some bleeds. To conclude PVLs is a vascular anomaly around uh, optic disc and uh, they are mostly asymptomatic and requires no intervention. Multimodal imaging plays a vital role in diagnosis and doing unnecessary investigations. Thank you. So how, what is the clinical importance of your presentation? So uh, to prevent uh, doing un unnecessary investigations and uh, identifying this condition as a rare entity, we can come to a conclusion that uh, 
uh, uh, such patients. Uh, but you did a lot of investigations. You did FFA. You did OCT. Uh, so, so, uh, so after the is second, that, is that what we should be doing for every patient? Who no, ma'am. After door? the second case, when we, we uh, diagnosed that post PRP case, we came to know we recognized this entity and this patient was not subject. So to for do. the post PRP case, did she actually require PRP? Did she have NVEs elsewhere, or was that? loop misdiagnosed as an NVD and she underwent. It was misdiagnosed as an NVD and we followed the case yeah. for six months and, and it, uh, yeah. we recognized that as a clinical But she entity. had a TRD in the other eye. Other eye, yes ma'am. So that's actually a case where an uh, angiogram is required for this eye yes. to note whether it is or not. Yes. But in the other cases, clinical signs which you should have emphasized to distinguish between the two. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Next. We have the Bihar. the Bihar State paper, Dr. Pratik. Good afternoon, uh, esteemed panel and uh, respected uh, audience. Clinical angiographic comparison of retinal findings and a new classification system for hypertensive retinopathy. I have no financial disclosures. So hypertension is one of the most common systemic diseases, a marker for preclinical pre uh, comorbidities and uh, about half of all retinal vascular occlusions are attributable to uncomplicated, uh, uncontrolled hypertension. Uh, existing classification systems for hypertensive retinopathy have their own limitations, including uh, not including retinal vascular occlusions into the any of the grades of the hypertension. The aim of the present study was to determine the clinical profile of patients with retinal vascular uh, vasculopathy in hypertension, with special emphasis on retinal vascular occlusions and patterns of angiographic changes. So this was a cross-sectional study at a tertiary teaching hospital uh, approved by the Institutional Ethics Committee. Uh, comorbidities were excluded on the basis of routine investigations, and the patients were treated as per standard protocol. Hypertension was defined as per the AHA SA criteria. And these are the eligibility criteria, so uh, less than 60 years old hypertensive patients with any grade of hypertensive retinopathy were included, and various comorbidity uh, were excluded uh, on the basis of internist referral and routine investigations. Uh, the BP was measured according to the WHO ISH criterion, and uh, all photographs, including fundus photographs and uh, FFAs, were uh, evaluated by a single experienced examiner blind to the ophthalmoscopic findings. Sequential monocular photographs of the worst eye were taken as part of the FFA. So 40 patients of uncontrolled hypertension and 80 eyes with hypertensive retinopathy were included, and other comorbidities were excluded as they could modify the retinal hypertensive changes. And uh, just the 30 males and 10 females were included, mostly in the age group of 45 to 49 years. Most presented with hypertensive crisis, which was controlled, and then the investigations were undertaken. Most were of irregular treatment. Arteriovenous changes were noted in up to 40% of the eyes. The background retinal changes were noted, and hemorrhages were the most common background retinal changes. These are some of the representative photographs from the uh, study. Uh, 10 eyes of 9 patients presented with retinal vascular occlusions on a background of hypertensive retinopathy. And these rates are consistent among uh, the subjects of hypertension seen in various uh, studies ac across the globe. BRVO was the most common retinal vascular occlusion noted. These are some of the re representative findings from the uh, cases. Uh, in particular, this case presented with bilateral uh, old STBRVO with neovascularization and had to be intervened with aggressive systemic control, intravitreal anti vegf and bilateral sectoral laser. Cardiovascular complications were the most common systemic uh, complications noted. And again, the hemorrhages were the most common systemic, uh, uh, the, the retinal findings in these systemic uh, complications. Uh, FFA was poorer at detecting heart exudates and macular star configurations, but better at detecting capillary bed changes, including non-perfusion, leakage, microaneurysms, and shunt vessels. So few differences were noted in clinically relevant findings, especially regarding capillary bed changes, which is similar to previous studies. It is known that retinal vascular occlusion is a risk factor for neovascularization, may be identifiable only by angiography. In our patients, we found considerable overlap between the grades of hypertensive retinopathy when the angiographic findings are considered alongside the clinical findings. 
Existing classification systems are basically based on uh, studies which include patients with multiple comorbidities whose effect is statistically corrected. The literature contains very few reports of proliferative retinopathy in hypertension, but it is not included in the grading of hypertension. Again, the use of the term malignant hypertensive retinopathy is a misnomer. Cases of mild and moderate hypertension were also found to suffer from retinal vascular occlusions and needed additional ocular treatments in our case, in our study. So, uh, patients with very few hemorrhages have no added risk of vision loss and may benefit from systemic control alone, whereas with vascular occlusions, there is risk of vision loss, stroke related morbidity and risk to life. With prolonged vascular stress and ischemia, this condition may also be bilateral as uh, we just shown. So this is uh, based on the expert opinion that the uh, new suggested system of hypertensive retinopathy includes retinal vascular occlusions in a background of hypertensive fundus with or without new, uh, new vascularization. Uh, without obvious new vascularization, with subclinical angiographically detected new vascularization, and with clinical NVD or NV, with the same definitions as is consistent with the uh, routine definition of NVD and NV. And then you have occult RVOs uh, with new vascularization. High risk hypertensive retinopathy is when all of this is very severe and associated with systemic complications. This study is not without limitations, especially because it has a very small sample size and FFA is performed uniocularly. So one-fourth of subjects uh, of hypertensive IDG is present with retinal vascular complications. Thank you. Thank you, doctor, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, we'll move on to the next uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Chaya Bharati, give me sunshine, I want to grow. Give me sunshine, I want to grow. To introduce, incidence of ROP is 20 to 30 percent of screen preterm newborns. Myopia in CBR ROP is 58 percent according to ET ROP study. History of laser is seen in 70 percent of ROP cases according to one et al. Infants with history of laser in CBR ROP, early and rapidly progressing myopia, they develop. And Glenock et al. said that higher myopia and laser eye as compared to those who received bevacizumab for zone 1 ROP. Bunker et al. studied 63 eyes with CBR ROP and injected intravitreal bevacizumab and no reactivation was seen after one year. My objectives are to evaluate the efficacy and safety of intravitreals without laser as primary treatment modality in APROP with plus disease. Zone 2 stage 3 in volume 1 to quadrants can be observed to prevent laser-induced myopia to buy time for retinal growth. My third, 35 eyes uh, of APROP was studied, 14 eyes had plus disease, 13 eyes had zone 2 stage 3 ROP. In 12 eyes, intravitreal ransomware, 0.025 ml was injected. Three eye, in 3 eyes, biosimilar was injected. In 4 eyes, reinjection was done. And follow up was done on post of third day, one weekly for one month, monthly for a year, yearly till date. Monitoring of systemic ocular neonatal and pediatric neurological developments done in collaboration with the neonatal neurologist. Outcome at 1 to 5 years of post injection, regression of ROP was seen. These are a few photographs of the APROP plus disease, APROP plus disease, and a case of APROP, again a case of APROP with plus disease, and APROP in twins with plus disease, a case of APROP, few photographs that has been taken by mobile, and a case of APROP. Tortuous vessels at zone two, with my results. 35 eyes has, have been studied and 22 were found with APROP. Plus disease was seen in 15 uh, eyes and in 12 eyes, ransomware was injected. In one eye, biosimilar was injected. Two eyes got, uh, got lost to follow up data and after three months were found to be normal. And uh, uh, reinjection was done in four eyes. In two eyes without plus disease, biosimilar was injected. In 13 eyes, zone two stage three was seen in which observation was done. But in four eyes, stage 4A was developed at zone 3 in one eye, at <coughs> zone 2 in three eyes. Reinjection with laser was done and found to be stable. Follow-up of 35 eyes, four eyes lost to follow-up and lost. Uh, mean birth weight was 1,033 grams. 
mean gestational age at birth was 29.2 weeks. Mean age at the time of injection was 1.6 months. Resolution of severe nervous club plus disease was seen. Decrease in venous child dilatation and arterial tortuosity. There was a resolution of NVI on third day. Fibrovascularization of dis uh, disappeared in 10 to 15 days. Progression of retinal vasculature beyond neovascular tissue into peripheral avascular retina was seen. Out of 35 eyes, only four eyes were lasered. Detached retinized floating lives in vitreous cavity. These are the post uh, results, I mean post injection photographs. And this is after second injection. And the pre-injection photographs, post injection photographs. APROP cases, we can see a ridge, the ridge got resolved itself. APROP pre-injection photograph, the post-injection photograph, pre-post-injection photographs, and loss to follow-up return case after three months, this, these are the photographs. To discuss, anti vegf immediately halts neovascularization in moderate to severe ROP, useful in progressive or unresponsive rush disease, advantages in rigid pupil, hazy media, in sick babies in whom laser would be difficult, allows vasculature in previously avascular retina in developing eyes, prevents complication of lasers like visual field loss, myopia, amblyopia, cataract, and anti segment schema. The shortcomings of my study was that it was small, and duration of study was short, angiography not done, fundus picture not available every time. To conclude, after five years of follow-up of intravital injections, they are safe and effective modality of therapy for moderate to severe ROP, less myopia is seen, no strasmismus seen, and no reactivation seen. To the take-home messages, decision of lasers can be delayed or avoided. Most of the lasers are done due to fear of RD or the patient may get lost to follow up. Lasers indu laser induced myopia is preventable. Not all AP ROP needs laser. Not all ridges land in RD. Intravital injections can be used to delay or cancel lasers. This is a photograph showing a lizard, uh, uh, lizard fovea done elsewhere, elsewhere. These are my references and these are my few happy patients. Thank you. Uh, thank you, your presentation. Uh, you have only repeated in four cases, anti -VEGF. Yes, sir. And rest, you have not uh, seen any power so that you yes, should sir. be able to do the laser. Yes, sir. So one and a half years, you have not done Five any... Five years, sir. Five years, you have not done laser in yes, those sir. who have been injected once anti -VEGF. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, this is a great study. I mean, uh, you, uh, what could have been developed if you have not done laser? Because people are 80 to 90 percent, uh, yes. 95, they are doing the laser after anti VEGF yes. or giving second injection. Yes. And second, the observation stage yes. three. Yes. Is it observation or patient didn't care? Sir, I always. Because you can't have a s observation yes. in such a ROP. Yes. Yes. Uh. I always uh, observe how many clocks have been involved. Supposingly, the patient has is landing in stage three. Then, if only one for one or two clocks are involved, or three clocks are involved, we can observe. And I always ask the patient to come on time. The time limit that I give to give to them ten days or one week. And this is how I clo closely follow them. The moment I feel that the ridge is getting too much elevated, and then uh, it, it's moving up upwards, then I have to take the chance of uh, uh, lasers. Otherwise, I keep observing observing and uh, till my five years uh, now I can say it's six years I, I have seen that this no reactivation seen and the patient is also not developing myopia only in two eyes I have done the re-injection also but that patient is now six years old has not developed myopia even though the fundus picture is uh, is appearing like a myopic uh, look it's giving a myopic look in may in future he may turn to be myopic but right now he's doing well okay okay you should present because many people are doing laser after anti yes, yes. that will avoid if you do double burn study yes. so that okay uh, your uh, um, presentation uh, you are saying myopia, madam, but you haven't presented data on myopia in this particular yes, I paper. I agree, ma'am. Yes. So that conclusion we cannot draw on this paper. I do agree that you are not seeing. Yes. What I find interesting is that in your table of patients that you showed, you had two babies in the AROP group who you said became normal without treatment. And then you had these three or four babies in your zone two, stage three, which you chose to observe but they developed stage 4. Yes, that, sir. Is yes, where, that is where I have my concern. And so uh, the decision, as you very rightly say, one or two clock hours you may not treat, but the presence of plus disease is the most important criteria that you need to mention when you are telling this. Yes, uh, that is the thing. One, yeah. quick, uh, one quick comment. So in aggressive ROP, when you are treating posterior disease, in most of the times when you are using short-acting antivirus like ranimizumab or the biosimilar, 
the vascularization progresses, but there is a lingering peripheral vascular retina in most cases. Now, whether you choose to laser that or observe that is a different thing. But how were you monitoring? Because you didn't do FFA. How did you monitor these babies when they were growing up? Because once they put on weight and they are in that eight months, 10 months old, it is you cannot see the zone three at all. You can't put a speculum. So what did you do for those cases? I always uh, follow two, three criteria for my judgment. One is that the patient is uh, uh, f two, three things are important. One, the repeated blood transfusion, repeated neonatal uh, admissions, and for like fundus examination, I, uh, like you're asking that 10 months or one year, maybe we cannot do the fundus examination. I always ask them that, let me do the fundus exam. I always, uh, when the baby comes to me, na, then I say, in, in uh, later on, we will have to do the fundus examination under sedation. So this is how I follow up my patients. So this you did I use general anesthesia or sedation when yes, they grew up? Yes, yes ma'am. Your methodology needs to clarify those things. Anyways, yes, thank you, madam. Nice presentation. Uh, can we In, move on? Achha, okay. Uh, can we move on to the next, Dr. Somak, sub silicon oil ERM removal? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. The topic is sub-silicon oil epimacular membrane removal, a better alternative for early post-operative immature macular membranes. So epimacular membrane or AMM are common after vitrectomy. It is actually ERM developed around the macula. It is a sign of post-operative PVR, vitrectomy with silicon oil, often unable to resist, restrict its development. Oil removal and membrane peeling may be a choice, but it is usually delayed till the retina is stably attached. The membranes often jeopardized visual recovery at it obscures the macula. So a different technique to remove the immature membranes is applied under the silicon oil, keeping the oil in situ. Thus, this sub-silicon oil removal of epimacular membrane facilitates clearing of macula. It provides better visual recovery and maintains the natural healing process. Also maintains good tamponade effect till retina is stably attached. Later oil removal can be done as required and as per choice. So purpose was to evaluate the visual improvement in silicon oil filled eyes after performing sub-silicon oil epimacular membrane removal without removing the oil. So uh, 10 eyes of 10 patients included in this two-month prospective interventional study all undergone EMM removal without removing the silicon oil. It is basically a two-port approach and no infusion system was used. That is a, it's a dry procedure. Uh, Follow-up done at two weeks and four weeks pre and post procedure vision and IOP was measured. Uh, pre and post procedure enhanced depth imaging OCT, that is EDI OCT was done in all cases, visual improvement and different parameters of anatomical changes like epimacular membrane status, foveal architecture changes, neurosensory retinal status were evaluated before and after membrane peeling. The presence of cystoid macular edema and the anatomical changes uh, of regression, resolve and persisting uh, CME uh, is noted. Any complication is also noted. So the results, the mean pre-procedure vision was 260 and post-procedure vision was found 645. The range is 160 to 624. Epimacular membrane was resolved in 80%. Uh, CME resolved in 50%. Persistent CME was noted in 30%. In one eye, it was mildly regressed and in one eye, it was was rather increased. Foveal atrophy was noted in 50% eyes and th thickening of fovea seen in 20%. Recurrence of subfoveal SRF seen in one eye. In one eye, neurosensory RD was resolved. Mild paraoperative hemorrhage was seen in 30% that resolved subsequently. Uh, minimal data is available in literature regarding this procedure. This method is rather unique as it keeps the tamponade in situ to provide extended support for a desired period. Significant regression of epimacular membrane was noted. Definitely it helped to regain uh, effective visual acuity. Associated foveal atrophy should be looked for as it may hinder visual recovery and has a poorer prognosis. So uh, to conclude, the sub-silicon oil epimacular membrane removal for early post-operative immature membranes is a better alternative to gain effective visual improvement without hampering the desired tamponade effect. It is safe and easy to perform and requires minimal manipulation. Thank you. When did you remove the ERM? After a Sorry? surgery, when did you remove the ERM? Uh, sir, it uh, depends on the ERM status. If the vision is hampered, 
I can do it even uh, two weeks after the primary surgery because I am keeping the oil in situ. So at any time post-operatively, I can do it. Uh, so what no, was the mean what? duration of removal of ERM in your, in your particular subset? Uh, mostly four weeks. You don't have the data? Yeah, I have not given that data. But it and is how long did you retain days. the oil after that? Ma'am, it is again depends on the situation and scenario. It, uh, usually, we remove the oil in three to four weeks on average, uh, three to four months on average. Uh, so I can keep on keeping that. But some patients require some long-term effects, so I keep them for six months. The oil is there for six months. No, why didn't you remove the oil at the first go if the retina is stable? Waiting for uh, two weeks or four weeks does not make a difference. No, sir. And you can uh, remove the oil after four yeah, weeks yeah, and simultaneously yeah, you yeah. can... Definitely, see, sir. Uh, uh, oil will give an hyperbetropic shift. The vision improvement will not be good. So, uh, if your purpose of attachment is done, then why can't you remove the oil at the uh, four weeks interval or six weeks interval? No, that why is have the... You chosen, why have you chosen this method? Mm, sir, or, this is the early removal of oil. That means before retina is stably attached or I am thinking the retina is not attached stably. No, uh, then you will have an immature membrane. Uh, the problem removing at two, uh, two weeks, either see uh, there are two things that you have not removed the membrane at the time of surgery. So you are intervening at two weeks. But if it is a PVR changes, the membrane will take somewhere around four to six weeks to mature. And if you remove as early as two to four weeks, then the reoccurrence of membrane can also occur. Yes, sir. That and can happen. And you are adding one more surgery to the patient. How does it add to? Uh, I know what is the advantage uh, you had uh, from the conventional method. If I wait for yes, two sir. more weeks, uh, what yes, is the advantage from now to then? Sir, Why did you uh, uh, go for this? Uh, the technique? first thing is initially we are supposed to remove or used to remove the mature membranes. We, in conventional process, we remove the mature membrane because the ret one thing retina is not stably attached. So we have to go for silicon oil removal and then we have to go for the uh, ERM removal. But in early cases, I think there is no harm in removing the immature membranes as the... Chalo, thank you, thank you. Ne next, next. Uh, Dr. Akash, neonatal multimodal imaging biomarkers in aggressive retinopathy. With A very good afternoon. So my topic is on AROP with anemia and what are the biomarkers to predict success of treatment. I do not have any financial interest. So ARP is an epidemic of the 21st century, India being the most populous country and one in four babies in India is a, is a ROP, is a preterm baby. But uh, it's one of the most challenging and most unpredictable disease and anti vegf has proven to be the era for the last decade. And uh, treating AROP is like charting in a ocean where the, the clinician faces a lot of challenges. So if you have a biomarker, it helps us to navigate easily. So we recently published our first OCT paper where we saw what are the biomarkers which helps us in predicting success for anti vegf treatment. And we found out two important biomarkers that is hyperreflectivity of inner retinal layers and choroidal thinning to be an ischemic biomarker that could predict poor outcomes or more read treatment or more reactivation or more peripheral avascular retina. So here is another example where you can see the eye which had uh, hyperreflectivity and choroidal thinning did uh, poorer compared to the other eye and had early reactivation. Similarly, there was high chance of peripheral avascular retina in ischemic eyes. And another important thing that we noticed in our first OCT paper was anemia was one of the main risk factor that decided, uh, you know, most of these babies were anemic. So this led to a question, what are we missing? So we are just giving anti vegf to these eyes. Are we treating only ocular ischemia or is there anything known as systemic ischemia? So the babies were imaged by a flying baby position where we simultaneously captured fundus photo and OCT uh, by this uh, wide field uh, device. And uh, this gives us an ultra wide field uh, OC, uh, fundus photo as well as simultaneous OCT uh, non-invasively. Here you can see uh, this helps us to image the entire retina, both multimodal imaging can be done. 
So what we noticed in our first paper is that uh, we missed on correcting anemia. So we wanted to see if anemia was promptly corrected by blood transfusion in these babies, could that result in a better outcome? So in babies, uh, anemia can be due to uh, immature hypo, uh, hematopoietic system. It could be because of anemic mothers, teenage pregnancy, poor antenatal care, postnatal infections, uh, maternal anemia, and all this adds up to systemic ischemia, which is an important factor. So in babies which are having moderate to uh, severe anemia, we also transfused along with giving an anti vegf inside the eye. So here you can see how uh, you can see multi-layered hemorrhages, sclerose vessel, the baby had 6.6 .6 grams of hemoglobin and we gave anti vegf and treated by blood transfusion, dramatic response within a couple of weeks. You can see the vessels opening up and reaching the periphery much more faster. Similarly here you can see in the above image, there are sclerose vessels and hemorrhages and when we gave anti vegf and treated the anemia by blood transfusion, a dramatic response, all the hemorrhage was gone within a week's time and the baby was doing uh, much better. Another example where you can see uh, eyes with the hemorrhages and uh, OCT also showing thin choroid and hyperreflectivity of inner retinal layers, suggestive highly ischemic eyes and uh, not just treating the eye with the anti vegf we treated the systemic ischemia by blood transmission too and a dramatic response in the inferior images you can see here. So definitely multi-layered hemorrhages and sclerose vessels and uh, uh, hyperreflectivity of inner retinal layers, which is also seen in other adult vascular diseases. Same way you can see that in, uh, ag uh, in aggressive ROP with uh, ischemia and choroidal thinning, which provides nutrition to the outer retinal layers. So what we noticed, here's another image where you can see all these hemorrhages uh, just by giving uh, blood transfusion and anti vegf within a week's time showed uh, dramatic response. So what we notice here is uh, in babies, we should not just concentrate on treating the ocular ischemia. Systemic ischemia must be an integral part of the management. Please coordinate with your neonatologist to correct uh, the breathing pattern, the feeding pattern, and also the hemoglobin has to be corrected or else the high chance of retreatment. Here you can see uh, some of the babies in whom we even, in, despite of telling the neonatologist, uh, you know, the or the parental consent was not there and babies were missed for anemia correction, they had a retreatment of about 70 to 80 percent. Whereas in babies in whom we could manage with blood transfusion promptly, uh, the retreatment rate was 30 percent. The peripheral avascular retina and reactivation was much lesser. So definitely this demands a treatment guideline change, demands a cultural shift in the way we handle these uh, babies, uh, where we have to treat uh, not just ocular ischemia, but also uh, the systemic ischemia promptly to give a favorable outcome and lesser chances of retreatment and reactivation in these babies. Thank you. Uh, thank you. There, there's a uh, earlier paper related with the anemia and the uh, type of ROP. The first paper was on just predicting the OCT biomarkers in anti vegf uh, prognostication of ROP. In that paper we saw uh, when we took all the systemic factors most of these babies had severe to moderate anemia, which we did not understand why the OCT biomarkers could not could have been not just ocular ischemia but also the underlying systemic ischemia. So in the second paper, we addressed this by prompt correction, and we noticed that these babies had faster uh, vascular progression, lesser chances of retreatment, and lesser chances of reactivation. Okay. Uh, in any of your babies, when you corrected the anemia by blood transfusion, did you see a transient worsening of ROP? Because we know that the fetal hemoglobin has a better oxygen binding capacity and when we transfuse with the adult hemoglobin, it sort of gives tissue oxygen and we see this transient worsening. So what was your, uh, the, the time frame between your injection and the blood transfusion and did you see any worsening of ROP? The blood transfusion was immediate within a couple of days in coordination with a neonatologist. Uh, none of our babies, we had any inadvertent vitreous hemorrhage or anything. Within three weeks, most of our eyes had better opening of loops. And you can see in the images, the sclerose vessels are completely gone and hemorrhages had, multi-layered hemorrhages had resolved. Uh, very good images, I must say. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Which uh, drug did you inject? Uh, we used bevacizumab, 0 .0, uh, zero. Point, uh, one third of the adult one, dose. One third of the adult, yeah. okay. And, uh, and what was your criteria for laser? Or was it just a default thing that you did it for all the babies? Uh, laser, if at all reactivation was seen anywhere during the follow-up, immediate laser was done or else if, uh, if power was noticed at 16th week, that is 4 months, okay. we did the laser because after that it would be difficult to examine. 16th though. week uh, you are counting from the birth, it's no. not, no, what is the corrected menstrual age when you… 16th did? week from day of injection. 
16 weeks from day of injection. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, you did not go by the baby's gestational age or post menstrual age no. for uh, calculating the no. part. 16 weeks from day of injection. The main reason being after that it is difficult to examine these bigger, heavier babies in OPD. Yeah. So we do the same thing. Yeah. The question in your institution, how many percent of patients you are doing laser after anti uh, So Overall. In this, we can. No, see not in this. Overall. 30, 30%. Only 30%. And reinjection? Uh, we Second do not reinject. We do not reinject. Uh, third question. Any systemic complication while doing the uh, test? Comorbidity, technia, uh, systemic dysplasia so of the children? We did not have any. Why in doing optos? We did not have any baby with apnea or feed intolerance, but we should take utmost precaution. We have a pediatrician in the same floor where we do this imaging. That precaution has to be taken. And a neonatal resuscitation kit has to be there in the same floor. Thank you. Thank you. Good presentation. Uh, can we have Dr. Neha with factors affecting visual outcome after SFL implantation in aphakic patients? I think you are in this podium, Dr. Neha. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, AIS, for giving me uh, 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 time to present my paper on factors affecting visual outcome after SFIL implantation in aphakic patient. I have a uh, nil financial interest and none conflict of interest. Now, coming to introduction, as we all know, the definition of aphakia is absence of lens and the main etiology are iatrogenic trauma and congenital. In congenital, it can be primary or secondary. The main management of aphakia are non-surgical and surgical. In non-surgical, we have aphakic spectacles, contact lens, and in surgical, on the basis of uh, PC status, it can be sulcus placed IOL, AC IOL, iris fixated IOL, or sclera fixated IOL. Now coming to objective of my study, it was to assess the visual outcome after SFIL implantation in aphakic patients and factors affecting visual outcome. It was a non-randomized retrospective clinical study and was conducted after taking institutional ethical committee permission. The study adhered to the tenets of declaration of Hensky. The parameters that were noted in pre-treatment findings was the etiology of aphakia, best corrected visual acuity, keratometry readings, intraocular pressure, and any other secondary ocular pathology other than aphakia. Uh, in treatment, intraoperative complication and time elapsed uh, since surgery. In post-treatment, residual refractive error, haptic status, lens centration, keratometry readings, intraocular pressures, and complication. The standard surgical procedure was uh, all pro procedures were performed by a single operating surgeon. Taking aseptic and antiseptic precaution, 270 degree peritomy was done. A toric marker was used to mark uh, diametrical opposite ends. The scleral pocket dissection was made using a crescent. 1.5 mm behind the limbus scleral entry was made with a 23 gauge microvetero retinal blade. And foldable multi-piece IOL was put either through limber or sclerocorneal groove. It was externalized using SFIL forceps and haptics were fixed. The peritomy was closed. Now coming to results from January 2020 to December 2022, a total of 36 patients underwent SFIL implantation by a single surgeon in our center, out of which two patients on operating table were found to have subclinical RD and were excluded from our study. Now coming to uh, demographic characteristic, the mean age of the patients were 44.5 plus minus 20.48. The range was from 7 to 74 years. Male-female ratio was 2 is to 1, which was non-significant. Also, the uh, eyes, uh, right eye was uh, 20, and left eye was 14. The mean follow-up uh, periods in months were 11.5 plus minus 4.2 months. The, uh, now coming to aphakia etiology, it was iatrogenic in 44.1% uh, and due to trauma in 55.9%. <laughs> 
the best corrected visual acuity in pre-op was uh, 1.73 plus minus 0.24 in logmar which significantly uh, um, improved from day one to six months now coming to complication analysis during intraoperative uh, complication we have IL uh, related complication in two pa patients in which haptic broke during operation and uh, high femur and retinal break were also present uh, in few patients. Now coming to immediate, the uh, most common complication was transient corneal edema which was 23.5% and raised intraocular pressure uh, in 26.5% patients. There were other complications also like vitreous hemorrhage, high femur and uh, now coming to early uh, post-operative uh, a complication. It was a uh, uh, IOL decentration was found in 8.8 percent, and people of abnormalities like uh, traumatic midriasis uh, were found in uh, six uh, uh, patients, uh, and uh, non patient and macular edema. Now, coming to late complication, we have haptic related uh, complications in 8.8 percent. Uh, patients like suture uh, haptic exposure, uh, corneal decompensation was noted in 5.9%. Uh, the main uh, uh, complication in late period were secondary glaucoma in 11.8% and astigmatism was in 32.3%, uh, that is nearly one third of the patient. Now coming to discussion, when compared to other studies, our study showed more uh, incidence of transient corneal edema. It may be due to poor endothelial count. In our study, there was no incidence of hypotonic choroidal detachment or endophthalmitis as similar to other studies. In long term, the most common uh, complication uh, was due to uh, astigmatism. My conclusion is the final visual outcome in SFL impl implantation depends both on anterior and posterior segment pathology. The outcome also depends on etiology of aphakia, whether it is hydrogenic or traumatic or any other ocular pathology. My take home message is whenever an SFL implantation is planned, along with thorough anterior and posterior segment examination, patients should be made well aware of outcomes and complications that can be encountered immediately or in long term. These are my references. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You said that uh, you looked into factors associated with outcomes, but that uh, in the results there were you didn't show any factors that were. Because uh, we have less patient, uh, we cannot get uh, half. Uh, Half of the patients nearly were hydrogenic or traumatic. When we will uh, compare, uh, uh, we did not have sufficient samples to um, uh, classify them. Thank you, Dr. Neha. Can we have Dr. Megha? Does baseline SFCT predict treatment response after intravitreal aflibercept? A very good afternoon to our respected panel members. The topic of my paper presentation is Does baseline subfoveal choroidal thickness predict treatment response after intravitreal aflibercept in diabetic macular edema? We don't have any financial interest. It is not changing. We don't have any financial interest. Background. <coughs> There is a limited availability of data on effect of aflibercept for DME management in subcontinent. Present study evaluated association between baseline SFCT in previously untreated eyes with DME. Aim of our study is to evaluate changes in SFCT in pa patient with DME following intravitreal aflibercept and to evaluate whether baseline okay. SFCT is a predictor to response okay. to treatment. We included treatment nave patient with central involving DME, patient with baseline CMT more than 250 micrometer and BCVA between ETDRS letter 70 to ETDRS letter 40, patient receiving three consecutive uh, injections of aflibercept at monthly intervals. We excluded patient with PDR, PPV or PRP and follow up less than six words. The treatment regime which we followed was that all the treated patients received three consecutive monthly intravitreal injections of aflibercept 1.25 mg per 0.05 ml. Patients were followed up at 1, 3, 6 and 9 months respectively. EDI-OCT and SD-OCT were performed at baseline and after each injection. SFCT was measured manually as a distance between RPE hyperreflective line and choreoscleral junction. 
a functional responder was defined as one with more than five ET DRS letter improvement in a vision, and an anatomical responder was defined as one with SFCT reduction more than 25 micron meter after the last injection of aflibercept. Statistics which we used were independent T test on continuous dependable variable and chi square test on categorical variables. A multivariate logistic regression model was constructed to see the impact of baseline subfovial choroidal thickness on outcome to intervention after adjusting for confounders. The relationship between the mean changes in SFCT after intervention was evaluated with Pearson correlation analysis. BCVA was recorded using Snellen's visual equity sum score and was converted to ETDRS letter score using the formula as given below. Outcomes, the mean changes from baseline in SFCT after last loading dose of aflibercept was the primary outcome measure and the mean changes in BCVA from baseline to the final study visit were the secondary outcome of the study. Table 1 compared the outcome measure between the functional responders and the non-responders. At 6 months after the last IV injection of aflibercept, the mean SFCT decreased significantly. The mean SFCT in functional responders was significantly higher as compared to non-responders at baseline. A paradoxical increase in SFCT was measured at 9 months. The mean vision gain in functional responders than the non-functional responders was 11 and 4 ETDRS letter respectively. Figure 1a depicts changes in ETDRS vision between functional responders and non-responders. Figure 1b depicts changes in ETDRS vision between anatomical responders and non-responders. Figure table 2 compare outcome measures between the anatomical responders and non-responders. A paradoxical increase in SFCT was seen at 9 months. The mean baseline SFCT in responders was significantly higher as compared to non-responders. The mean vision gain in anatomical responders and non-responders was 10 and 4 ETDRS letter respectively. Figure 2a depicts changes in subfovial choroidal thickness between functional responders and non-responders. Figure 2b depicts changes in subfovial choroidal thickness between anatomical responders and non-responders. Predictor for response to treatment. Multiple logistic regression after adjusting for confounders revealed that a thicker baseline SFCT or worse baseline BCVA were predictor for achieving better anatomical and functional response. A higher baseline SFCT has an increased likelihood of achieving a better anatomical response. Here is the table 3 showing the regression coefficient for anatomical responders. To conclude, SFCT show a biphasic response to intervention with a non-significant increase after 6 months. SFCT has a prognostic value for response to treatment. Baseline SFCT has a prognostic significance for treatment response. Take home message is raised SFCT before treatment has better response to aflibercept. Here are the some references. Thank you. What are the previous studies about SFCT telling you about in, in diabetic? Ma'am, they are showing that uh, after the injections, SFCT is decreasing. So, so what do you think is the mechanism in which the SFCT shows a biphasic response in ma'am because case. of the waning effect of aflibercept there is a showing in a depict uh, so if this is SFCT. related to your aflibercept injection how is it a predictive ma'am uh, as we follow a rule of 10% uh, cst and 5% letters rule that means 10% decrease in the cft and five letter gain in a uh, five letter etdrs gain is the is the um, ma'am predictor which we follow Okay. Which machine you are using? Ma'am, uh, sir, EDIOCT, spectral EDIOCT for measuring this. Okay, choroidal thickness, how you, how you have measured? By, By EDI. EDIOCT machine, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we have Dr. Anujit for membrane patterns of choroidal nevascularization on OCT angiography? Patterns for choroidal neovascular. My 
Good afternoon. My topic reads Membrane Patterns for Choroidal Neovascularization on Optical Coherence Tomography Angiography. The authors do not have any financial interest in the subject matter of this presentation. So age-related macular degeneration is the leading cause of irreversible blindness in elderly. Clinically, it can be classified into a dry and a wet or exudative type. And dye-based angiography, including OCT, has been the gold standard for accurate diagnosis and classification of AMD. OCT-A or OCTA is a novel invasive technology that we use for rapid visualization of vascular plexuses from the ILM till the choroid. The purpose of this study was to evaluate the morphological patterns of choroidal neovascularization on OCTA in treatment naive, continuously treated and previously treated patients of exudative AMD. A retrospective study was uh, conducted all, with all patients having choroidal neovascularization and 46 eligible eyes were chosen. The inclusion criteria were patients that were diagnosed with type 1 or type 2 neovascularization secondary to AMD and in whom a membrane pattern could be identified. Those with prior photodynamic therapy, myopic uh, uh, choroidal neovascularization, CSR or signal strength less than 40 were excluded. In the initial diagnosis was done through clinical examination and OCT and signs of neovascularization on octa were noted as presence of subretinal hyperreflective material, pigment epithelial detachments, intraretinal, subretinal or sub RP fluid. To classify inactive neo neovascularization, history of any active neovascularization that was treated with anti vegf therapy at least six months before examination with no signs of clinical activity on clinical examination OCT. Type 3 neovascularization was excluded because it may not initially involve the choroid. All patients underwent a comprehensive examination and the anti vegf chosen for the study was intravitreal brolicizumab. Evaluation of the OCTA scans were done by 6 cross 6 mm criteria with automatic segmentation and in those patients that automatic segmentation was not possible, manually the lesions were segmented. So as described, the, the lesions were classified as a well-defined or an ill-defined pattern, where a well-defined pattern was classified as a medusa head as vessels branching in all directions from the center, a C-fan pattern where 90% vessels are branching, and a, or a long dilated filamentous pattern. Ill-defined membranes were those lacking a distinct morphology but still had branching capillary loops uh, with or without anastomotic groups. So they were classified into a treatment naive, a previously treated, and an inactive neovascular, uh, inactive neovascular membrane category at the time of evaluation. Statistical analysis was done by one-way variance and Pearson chi-square test, and a P less than 0 0.05 was considered statistically significant. So in the 46 eyes that were chosen for the study, 76% had type 1 neovascularization with an average age of 77.9 years, plus minus. Out of the 46 size, 72% had active neovascularization, out of which 70% of that population were already receiving prior anti vegf therapy, and 28% had inactive neovascularization. Once again, out of the 46 eyes, 64% had a well-defined morphology, out of which a majority were either medusa head or long filamentous pattern, and 36% eyes had an ill-defined morphology. So in our results, the most frequently identified membrane morphology was a well-defined, as, and in type 1 neovascularization, majority had a well-defined, as was in type 2 neovascularization as well. And there was a statistically significant difference in membrane morphology between the two groups. These are some representative images of the patients which showing seemingly inactive OCT but still having a membrane pattern on the octa. This is another example of a long filamentous pattern on octa, whereas the OCT is showing regression. So correlation of clinical activity has been studied previously, and CFAN and Medusa head patterns have been reported previously. Some authors have reported other classifications like a loose, dense, loose net pattern or a dense net pattern. In fact, Ling et al. had previously reported that poorly, uh, di uh, poorly defined vessels could be associated with inactive or active disease as well. In our study, clinically active diseases had a well-defined morphology, but however, almost half the person of the clinically inactive diseases on OCT also had a well-defined morphology. So this makes octa-based morphological patterns not always suitable and reliable for prognostication of these cases. Also, long filamentous patterns uh, was included for chronicity of the disease. Also, there was no statistically significant difference between the presence of ill-defined membrane morphologies, and rate of ill-defined morphologies was lower in patients treated with anti-VEGF. So in conclusion, well Defined vessels patterns could be seen in both inactive as well as uh, active neovascularization, and long filamentous patterns was associated with inactive neovascularization. My take-home message is that membranous pat membrane patterns on octa do not always serve as clinically suitable prognostic markers or as an adjunct to OCT for prognostication of exudative AMD. These are my references. Thank you. The earlier these studies were, uh, was done, similar studies was done in the literature. Yes, there are, there are studies from outside that have been done, sir. Okay. Dr. Pooja, anything? So, you say that, that 
that uh, getting an octa is not very helpful uh, because whatever pattern you see is not predictive of anything. So, what is currently how do you treat your patients based on do you Cur use octa as for your tre treatment guidelines or monitoring guidelines or just doing the routine? So currently we are using OCT and presence of subretinal intraretinal fluid, but the octa membrane patterns are not correlating with the clinical activity on subretinal or intraretinal fluid. So we are still using OCT. Yeah, actually, if you saw the same patient along longitudinally, naive, treated, and went dry, you would see changes in the membrane pattern. Yes. You're seeing different patients. So when you see them, that's probably when you would see. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Last call are the missing candidates, Dr. Abhishek or Dr. Hamad here. OK, we conclude this session. Thank you, everybody. Can we have a quick picture with all the speakers who are present over here?